Welcome. Hey, there's Gina. Hey, Gina. Hi. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Oh, I am. I'm I can good. Hear you now. I can hear you now. Welcome, I everybody. I wanted to wish Hi. you good. Um, hey, there. Happy, happy hour, everyone. <laughs> Welcome in. Oh, no. you. Hello. It looks like oh. some people have gotten started. Uh oh. Big trouble. <laughs> okay. It's 5.01. I'm going to keep an eye on the, the weight room. We may have a few more joining us. Um, so the first thing is I, I'm going to ask uh, if everyone can mute. And, uh, and I'll give you a little rundown of how it's going to go. And uh, so we've have, we have enough. It is five, so we will get started. Uh, and we do have quite a bit to, to eat and drink today. So um, first of all, my name is Robbie G. I'm the professor of cheese. And uh, I am the representative from Venissimo today. Gina is there somewhere. Um, do you want to wave Gina? Gina is also from Venissimo. And uh, so welcome, everybody. I'm going to introduce you to our special guest in a moment. His name is Serge. He's the guy with those giant tequila bottles in front of him. Uh, we're going to give you a whole rundown um, on what's in front of you. I want to get started because we're going to back up and do um, kind of a longer intro. There's an echo. So again, I want to just ask if everyone can. It's um, but we're gonna we're gonna go through an order. We've got um, the list of the cheeses on is on your lid, and so we've got four cheeses and four expressions of agave that we are gonna taste through today. As always, we will go in order from mild to wild. Um, we um, so starting off uh, the order. This is the midnight moon. It's the triangular one. This is gonna be the first cheese we're gonna taste. You've got three or four of these triangular pieces. Um, there's another one that is a triangular piece and that's the Idiasa ball. So they, they do sort of look alike. The Idiasa ball is the one that has a kind of an orange on the rind. So that's, that's not the one we're tasting first. The, the Midnight Moon is the first one and we're gonna taste this with the Blanco. So I just want to set up the first pairing, and then we're going to go back and give you guys a lot more information, but we wanted to uh, not make the mistake of talking it without you eating right off the bat. Um, so dig in, and I want to toss it to Serge really quick because he's going to tell you a little bit about how to taste like a pro and, uh, and about the, the agaves that are in front of you. Take it away, Serge. Absolutely. First of all, I want to say thank you for joining us, guys. I'm it's very, very happy to be here. I've been looking forward to this all week. Uh, so yeah, my name is Sergio Muniz. I'm the California brand ambassador for Tequila Don Fulano. And basically, we're going to kind of go over what you have in front of you. We have four of our expressions. We have our Blanco, our Reposado, and our which is going to be the, the slightly darker one, our Añejo, which is going to be the, the lot darker one. And and then the Fuerte, all the bottles should be labeled for you so you don't, don't confuse, confuse yourself. So just to kind of give you a little kind of pro tip on how to uh, taste spirits or, or tequila in general, when you're smelling, uh, you want to open your mouth a little bit. That way you don't get as much burn through the nose and the inner part of the nose. So when you're smelling, just open your mouth just like a quarter of an inch. It, it makes all the difference, really. And when you're tasting any kind of spirit, um, like tequila especially, you want to taste just a little bit first and it kind of run it through your palate, almost like a, like a warm up. And then you want to take your real sip. And then that's how you kind of don't shock your palate before it's ready to take in this beautiful juice. So I guess first and foremost, we'll go salute everyone. Thank you again for joining us. I appreciate you guys coming. So I love the coffee mug, Robbie. <laughs> awesome. But uh, yeah, so this is our, our Blanco. Our Blanco is our kind of our base expression. It's unaged. It's, um, you know, we, Don Fulano kind of, we stick to very traditional methods of, of making uh, tequila. We cook our agave very slowly in autoclave ovens for about 30 something hours, uh, anywhere between 26 and 32. And then we, we ferment, we drink our proprietary yeast. We distill with two different types of distillation. And then this is unaged, and we'll go over all the other ones later. But 
again, we just kind of want to go over the, the Blanco first. And to that, I say cheers. And I'll uh, throw it back to you, Robbie. All right. So cool. I'm going to give you a little bit more background. I do want to say, too, um, if you have questions, what we'll do is we will pause um, after each pairing, after we talk about um, each of the pairings and why we chose them. Um, and um, so the easiest way is probably for you guys to chat questions and we'll keep an eye on that um, and we'll answer everything as, as they come, but we'll kind of pause. Uh, and if you do have a burning desire, feel free to unmute yourself and, uh, and, and ask a question too when, when we pause and do the question uh, part. Or if I say something stupid, feel free to interrupt me and say, no, 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 that's not, that's not how it is. Um, I'm, I'm at home now and I'm, I'm actually in my Mexican tile room and I chose this room because we're doing, because uh, it, it fits the theme. The plates, um, I wanna tell you about all the cheeses on the plate so we know what's what. I've already told you about two of them, which was the Midnight Moon and the Idiasa Ball. But the second cheese that we're gonna be tasting, just so you know, is the Prairie Breeze and that's this um, white rectangular square one. That's gonna be the second one. The third one is the Idiasa Ball. So look for that colored rind on it. And we'll tell you more about each one, of course, as we get to them. The blue cheese is the Glacier Blue and should be easy to identify that one. We did a little piece of peanut marzipan on each plate. So that's new for us. We don't carry this, I don't think, at the shop. But um, again, it fit the theme. Today, we have our uh, signature rosemary. Got to have the rosemary. There are hazelnuts, blueberries, uh, blackberry. This is a hibiscus jam. So please play around with that. There is a uh, dried apricots. This is a dried kiwi. And then this looks like a, a blood orange. So that's fun. Um, then you all have crackers as well. Um, so the first thing that we try to do when we put these together is we try to taste in order from mild to wild. Um, because we are doing spirits today, we, um, we just ignored the mild cheeses in the case. And we went straight to big and wild. Um, so the first one is uh, comparatively the, the mildest of the bunch, um, but it's, it's definitely not uh, shy in terms of flavor. It's the Midnight Moon. And, uh, and the Midnight Moon is, uh, the Midnight Moon is a Gouda style cheese. It's from Cypress Grove who are based in California. But because this is a Gouda, they actually have this cheese made in the Netherlands, which is the home of Gouda. There's a few things that define Gouda and uh, they have to do with the, the physical appearance. They are wrapped and aged in wax. And so there's a little bit of wax that this cheese is, is wrapped in when we get it. Um, my piece does not have the waxy rind. It's a dark rind that, that comes on it. Mine doesn't have that. So it looks like it was peeled off. There's a question there, do you eat rinds on, for, on the midnight moon? If, if, the, if the black or dark blue part is not there, you can eat this. It's a natural rind just underneath the wax part. Um, it may um, taste a little waxy because it's been touching the wax, but it is, it is good, good to eat. It's not gonna hurt you. You can eat wax. It just takes a long time to digest, by the way. Um, that was a joke. Um, so that's the Midnight Moon. Um, we're gonna go with um, different types of pairings. We, you know, as I mentioned, these are really, really strong beverages. So we needed cheeses to stand up. Um, so most everything you see, it, well, they're all aged. Some are just aged longer than others. This one is aged for about nine months and age is where cheese gets all of its character. Goudas take on a sweetness. So this is definitely gonna have kind of a sweetness and a tang to it. And the tang comes from the fact that it's goat's milk. Um, it's gonna be very different from the other cheeses, even though they're, they're hard and they're, they're pretty close in age, very, very different styles of cheese. Um, so I'm interested to get your, your feedback. Um, and I, you know, we did pick formal pairings uh, as, as we go along here, but please feel free to mix and match because there's no right or wrong. Um, there's, it's kind of fun to play around with, with everything on the plate, as long as you didn't shoot the first tequila down, save a little bit for, uh, for the other cheeses as well. Serge, tell us more about the tequila. Absolutely. So I guess we'll start with the, uh, the Blanco. So I guess we'll go a little bit about kind of the, the story of tequila Don Fulano. 
Uh, it was started, founded by two gentlemen uh, by the name of Enrique Fonseca and Sergio Mendoza, different Sergio, not me, who, uh, whose family have been in the, tiki, in the agave farming business since the late 1800s. And they, till this day, they're still probably one of the biggest purveyors of agave in all of Mexico. And it wasn't until the 1980s that they finally fulfilled their dream of wanting to make their own tequila and bought a distillery and started and started making their own uh, agave juice. You know, it uh, it was it's been a, a long time of kind of trial and error. You see, these guys haven't been farmers for so long; didn't really know a whole lot about the art of distillation, fermentation, and aging. And you know, there's a lot of European influence in this spirit because. That's where they learned kind of all how to use and uh, all the tools that they had been given. And so first is in the distillation. Again, we use two types of distillation. We use a copper pot still for about 80% of the final product. And then a 20% uh, uh, what's called a coffee still or a continuous still. That gives it a very kind of delicate um, flavor profile. So, you know, we'll start with the Blanco. The Blanco, again, is unaged. It's kind of like our, our base spirit. I like to, this is a very soothing Blanco. You know, there's a lot of, a uh, little bit of mint, cooked pineapple, uh, just very easy, very mellow Blanco tequila, very smooth, very easy drinking, very easy going. And yeah, yeah. so I think this pairs nicely with, with this first cheese. Um, do you recommend eating the cheese and then drinking or drinking and then eating cheese? Yeah, so what, what we typically do, and these, this is a suggestion, uh, is... I try the, the beverage first, and this goes for whatever we're pairing with cheese, but I like to try the, the beverage first on its own before any cheese is coated your mouth. Um, the next step is have a bite of the cheese on its own. And then as a third step, we try them together. So a bite of the cheese, um, maybe press it against the top of your mouth, have a couple chews, and then a sip of the agave and, and see how they do together. Um, that's how we, that's how we taste when we sit down with, you know, with restaurants or wineries, breweries. But again, you know, I, I always want to make make it very clear that do whatever you want. I mean, whatever makes you happy. Um, don't don't ever lose the kind of the point of this, which is to have fun. You know, we're here to give you all the little tidbits and factoids, but um, but remember, it's all about having fun, and there's no right or wrong with any of this stuff. Tequila and cheese, man. Of course, it's gonna be fun. <laughs> How could, yeah, how could you go wrong with, you know, you cheese wrong? And, and tequila? Um, so a couple of really interesting things that, uh, and I love hearing other people talk about their craft. I mean, I, I know all about cheese and I learn a lot um, when I, when I co-present with people. And I, I also see a lot of similarities too. And I, like when I hear Serge talking about um, some of, some of the process. And one of the things you mentioned is something that I also mentioned in my intro, which is aging. And uh, so the Blanco, you know, is means white and it doesn't take on any color because it's not aged at all. Is that correct? Yeah. It, the age comes from the, uh, or the, the color comes from aging in, in, in the barrels. And uh, so cheeses are also, you, you can break cheese down as being either fresh or not fresh. I mean, if, 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 there, if you were to break cheese down in the two most basic categories, it would be fresh or aged. We, we focus on mostly cheeses that are aged. All of these cheeses are aged. Um, and the reason why you, you wouldn't see a lot of, you wouldn't see a fresh cheese on a plate like this is because fresh cheeses are, they don't take on a lot of complexity or character. All of that happens during the aging process. The most identifying characteristic that happens to cheese as it ages is, it, is that it grows a rind. So one of the ways to uh, to identify that a cheese is aged or not is if it has a rind. And um, so even though some of the pieces on your plates, you can't see the rind, they had a rind because they were aged. Um, now, some examples of cheeses that are, that are not aged, that are fresh, and that just means they skip the last step in the process. So this would be like the, um, the equivalent of a Blanco in the cheese world, uh, mozzarella, ricotta, Burrata. Um, they typically, like when you see them in the cheese shop, these types of cheeses are in a bucket or in, uh, you know, like a, a little, you know, container with water. There's no rind to hold them in place. And, uh, and they're great cheeses. They just kind of serve a different purpose. They wouldn't be typically paired with, with other craft 
products. It would be, you know, something that is great on pizza or other other simple dishes, simple and, and, and clean and, and very uh, fresh dishes. Um, any thoughts uh, so far? How, how's everybody feeling? Any questions? See a thumbs up. It's feeling pretty good. Isn't it beautiful? It's, uh, it feels so, it just, the time, I, the timing feels weird. I, I um, the time changed. And so uh, I'm a little bit off all day, but uh, nothing, little tequila and cheese won't, won't help out. Um, so the, I already the, opened the next one. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, the, so the next, the next cheese, you guys, as we move on is going to be the Prairie Breeze. And the Prairie Breeze is the cheddar, but I want to have Serge talk about the agave first, um, and then we'll go back to the cheese. Sure, so uh, the second one you're gonna have is our reposado. This is our reposado right here. It's, so our, our reposado is any, aged anywhere between eight and 11 months, roughly. Uh, so uh, the CRT, which is with the, the Regulatory Council of Tequila or Consejo Regulador de Tequila, there they mandate that your reposado can be aged anywhere between 60, day, 60 days to a year. Now, a lot of tequila brands will use um, uh, ex bourbon American oak uh, casks or barrels. And, you know, the reason being that. Uh, whiskey has to use brand new barrels every time they age their 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 product. It, that's not and that's not the case with tequila. But we've opted to use ex wine French oak barrels. Now you can kind of tell for those who enjoy reposados on the on the regular. This is a much lighter colored reposado, and the reason of that being is because we use a French oak. The French oak is gonna give is gonna give us that complexity of flavor that a barrel uh, will give you while, may, while staying true to the agave flavor. You're gonna get um, very light um, kind of prune, coconut, vanilla uh, notes, um, but they're very subtle. They're you're gonna get still that kind of uh, cooked agave flavor while at the same time getting that mild oakiness to it. And this is why this is kind of like our love letter to the agave plant. You know, we, we didn't wanna steer too far from the, uh, from the agave. So yeah, this is my personal favorite expression, the reposado. So again, this is anywhere aged between six up to 11 months. And we'll also add on up older aged tequilas, but anywhere up to three years. We'll add it just to add more complexity to, uh, to the flavor profile. So salute guys, cheers. Hope you enjoy our reposado. And I guess you wanna talk about the cheese? Yeah, and um, so you can see as we, as we taste, as we go, you typically age um, means complexity, uh, and, and so we kind of work our way up. And so uh, the next cheese is a little bit more aged. Uh, the Prairie Breeze is the cheddar, in case you missed um, what I said before. This is, this is what it looks like. So it's kind of white, off-white, uh, and it's from, it's from the United States. It's, it's from Iowa. It's from southern Iowa. It's a small... Uh, family, family farm, cheesemaker. Um, they they buy all of their milk from local uh, Amish farmers, and uh, so it doesn't travel very far. And they make uh, a very delicious and a very sharp uh, white cheddar. Uh, so, so the first two cheeses, and you notice are cheddar and gouda. These are these are like the two most probably famous hard cheeses out there. Um, I I um I want to say a quick word because. I, I've had um, the experience, I, you know, I, I talk cheese all the time and, and some people when they hear the, you know, the, the styled cheddar or Gouda, maybe they think pedestrian. Uh, you think, ah, you know, I've, I've had that before. And, you know, cr yeah, it's true, Kraft Singles and American cheese, they all fall in the, the cheddar category, the cheddar family, if you will. Um, but, but cheddars and Goudas are truly some of the most complex and uh, in, in, in amazing cheeses in the world, there's really only a handful of styles of cheese out there. And so, um, you know, each of our shops will have a dozen or so Goudas and, and, and Cheddars. And um, Goudas and Cheddars can both be made with any type of milk. They, um, Goudas come from Holland 
And uh, cheddars originate in Southwest England around a town of cheddar, but they're now made everywhere. Um, so uh, Serge was, was talking about the regulatory system that controls and protects the names of, of tequilas and they have to come from a certain region and a certain type of agave and blah, blah. You know, there's all kinds of bullet points. Well, the same goes for cheeses. Um, cheddar though is, is a cheese that is, um, is, the word itself is not protected. So it is made everywhere. What cheddars have in common is the way that they're made. And uh, so they're, they're, they're made in a way where the cheesemaker actually stacks these big slabs of curd on top of one on top of the other. And it, and it gives it a bite. It gives it a very uh, acidic tang, which we identify as being sharp, it's sharpness. And, um, but they're really some of the strongest and most complex cheeses in the world. And they're great for pairing. They're super versatile. One thing that happens when we go through pairings is we have to be careful that whatever we're pairing the cheese with doesn't over doesn't overwhelm the cheese. We're looking for balance as well. So I think the first kind of general guideline I gave was tasting an order from mild to wild. That is something to think about whether you're doing cheese, tequila, whiskey, wine, beer, anything. If you if you have a flight, try to go in order. But the second one is matching strengths. And um, and so when we do spirits, there's um, we don't have um, there, there's not the subtlety of trying to pair with wine. So we're going big on the cheeses. And, and yes, we've all heard of cheddar, but cheddars are some of the biggest, most, um, really most complex cheeses out there. Any questions? If you have questions, don't, don't hesitate to chat or unmute yourselves and, and shout it out. We're doing, um, we did Zoom this time. We usually do YouTube and, um, I'm not sure why we did Zoom this time, but we're, we are recording it. We're gonna probably put it on YouTube later, if, if, um, just F, FYI, if you wanna come back and look at it. Um, so how long was this cheddar age? Good question. So this, this cheddar, their prairie breeze has to go a minimum of nine months. So that's about what that Gouda was. Um, this wheel was aged a little bit longer than that. This is closer to a year. Um, so it's, it, you know, it says a year, but I would give or take a couple of months, but we'll call it 12 months. Um, if it were to age longer, it would just get sharper and sharper and sharper. Um, there's, no, there's no right or wrong as well when it comes to age, it's all preference. Um, so we have, we have a cheese maker called Hooks and they're out of Wisconsin and we carry their five year, 10 year, 15 year, 12 year. And um, you know, it's just, it, it kind of just, depend when you when you taste them they call that a vertical tasting when you taste different ages of the same cheese and um if you happen to like the 10 year like i think we get more praise for the 10 year than we do for the 12 year that we carry and we tend to, to carry that more than we do the older one so again same thing with parmigiano reggiano uh, we carry a two-year parm even though there's a three-year available and it's just because that, that's the one that suits us that we like the best I'm finding this cheddar, it goes really nice with the Blanco too. Yeah. If you guys uh, have any, have, have any, have any left, the, the, <laughs> the second cheese goes really nicely with our Blanco. I'm trying to, I'm trying to try all of them. And uh, for those out there who haven't completely finished all your, um, all your product, I love, uh, I love if you guys send me your pictures. If uh, you guys have take any of, of, uh, of your tasting experience, we'd, uh, we'll put you on blast on our social media page and, We'll give you all the credit, don't worry. <laughs> um, you know, the other thing that Serge mentioned was color. And uh, color is, it comes up a lot when we talk about cheddars. And there are, um, we know a lot of cheddars are orange and yellow. And uh, that, that is tied to a, a, a dye, a natural dye, which is called annatto. And um, so anytime you see cheeses that are, that are orange, that's not the, the color that it, the milk comes out of the cow. Um, it is, it is uh, <laughs> enhanced, if you will. They, but the reason they started coloring ch cheeses is because the um, milk that comes from the spring in the summer months uh, when the animal is on a healthier diet is, it takes on a darker tint, a healthier tint. And so the cheese actually looks a little bit healthier and darker. And um, so cheese makers and cheese mongers 
um, a few hundred years ago started um, coloring them really to trick the consumer. And it just got a little bit out of control, but now it's more tradition than anything. It's cheddars are the ones that get colored the most, but um, some goudas get colored and some other cheeses as well. It doesn't really, it doesn't really make any difference. So there's not really a difference between a white cheddar or orange cheddar in terms of flavor. It's, um, it's more tied now to tradition. So like a lot of the Wisconsin cheddar makers will color uh, Tillamook, who's up in Oregon, they color their cheddars as well. But I mean, I served one this morning uh, from England called Rustic Red and it's, it's bright red. I mean, it's uh, or, uh, more orange, but it's an English cheddar that um, gets colored. It's interesting. That's very much kind of aligned with, uh, with kind of the tequila business. You know, this, this, the tequila game has kind of gone through more um, phases than most spirits. I mean, when it started out, you know, in the late 1800s and we're first kind of exporting tequila, it was a, a relatively unknown uh, product. You know, they were selling it as a Mexican whiskey or a Mexican rum, Mexican aperitif to, to make, to, to sell. And it wasn't the biggest kind of explosion that the tequila business took was in the 90s when kind of the rise of the cantinas and the going to Mexico and shooting tequila with salt and lime and which is very much aligned with the kind of, you know, you saw a sour mix coming out of the bag and the margaritas that would give you headaches for three days. Hmm. And, you know, that's when, when tequila is mass produced, that's when people start to add additives, you know, um, legally, uh, to be called tequila, you only have to ha it only has to be made 51% of agave. Uh, most tequilas now are made 100% agave, but they're still they're still allowing a 1% of um, certain additives that you can add to it, which is you know caramel extract, oak extract. We are 100% certified zero additives. This is cooked agave, uh, proprietary yeast, and volcanic spring water. Those are the only three ingredients that go into making our tequila and the reason being you know agave is a beautiful plant agave if you think about how long it, an agave takes it takes anywhere between six and 12 years to grow you could be walking in the agave fields and literally have two plants right next to each other that are within years of having to be of, of being harvested you know it's not it's a very complex a uh, plan that takes years to kind of the, the learn how to how to deal with it, which is why our background in farming is so important. We're the only brand that I know of that supplies 100% of the agave used in our tequila. You know, most brands will maybe hit the 30% mark, and we supply all of it. All the agave used in our tequila is grown by us, and that's something we pride ourselves in. And you know. Agave, the, the agave plant has so many gifts to give, but in order to get those gifts, you have to give it time. You know, you have to uh, slowly cook the agave. You have to ferment at its pace. You have to take your time with the, with the aging and the cooking and all that part. And when you're mass producing something, that's when you start cutting corners. That's when you start adding those additives in order to replace the gifts that you're not allowing the agave to give you. So when you get a certain, like a harsh vanilla note in a, any kind of spirit, that's not coming from nature. That's coming from something that's been added to your spirit in order to get that flavor profile. Everything, you know, the, 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 the subtleties and the sweetness that you get are gonna come from uh, um, the oak that we give or the aging or the, the fermentation or the agave as a raw material. So that's, you know, just something we pride ourselves in and taking our time in making our beautiful spirit. And I guess I could get into the Añejo, uh, Rob? Sir, it's a question. Um, is there yeah. a shortage uh, for agave plants? 100%. In fact, we're in one of the biggest shortages in history. So let just give you a perspective. So if you think about what I just told you, the agave takes anywhere between six and 12 years to grow, right? So from last year, tequila as a business is up 65% wow. from last year. Now, mind you, this is a COVID year. This is a year where no one was going out. 
you know, the, the tequila being drank was at, at your home, right? And there, if I had told you 10 years from now that tequila would be up, you know, that much, there's no way I'd believe you. So when you have to plan ahead for, you know, 10 years or so, you're going to run out. Every 10 years, there's a shortage. In about two or three years, we're going to have all the agave we need. So five, I won't say four years ago, the agave was three pesos for a kilo of agave. Right now, it's at 30. So just to kind of give you perspective on, because, you know, when there's a shortage, the people who kind of benefit the most are the farmers. So, you know, they get to kind of set their price and, you know, and sell the agave to whatever price they want. So now everybody needs agave. So now nobody, now the smaller producers can't get their hands on it. But because we farm our own, we get the kind of first pick on the agave. And we get to make sure that every agave we use is fully mature and ready to be harvested to make tequila. There's this, this terrible trend right now in, in agave farming where they think that at three to four years, their agave has reached its peak size Therefore, it's reached its peak maturity. But it's like saying a person who's 18 years old, yeah, they've stopped growing, so they're fully mature. Well, that's just not the case. There's so much that has to happen internally for the plant to fully mature. And that's when you start, you know, having to add all those additives in order to make up for the time that you're not allowing the agave to give you. So uh, yeah, hopefully that uh, answers your question. Did people start drinking more during COVID? Is that what happened? People, people yeah, absolutely. I it's mean, like as of uh, last year, so the, the year before COVID, we were, uh, our sales wise, we were at 70% uh, for, uh, that were sold in restaurants and bars and 30% um, kind of retail. Last year was 80% retail and 20% uh, what's called on-premise, which is restaurants and bars. And we almost hit the same number. So people are definitely drinking. Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, we had a shortage in toilet paper uh, this time last year too, remember? Yeah, absolutely. The, um, okay, you wanna do the next? Let's the do next it. Tequila? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's go with the, uh, the Añejo. Añejo, I mean, you know, this beautiful color. Um, this will, this, so our, um, aging for this is a minimum of 30 months. Again, so the CRT will tell your Blanco is either unaged or aged for 60 days tops. Reposado is 60 days to a year and Añejo is a year to three years. Anything over an extra Añejo, sorry, over three years is an extra Añejo. So what we do is we will age it for a minimum of 30 months and then we'll add anywhere between two, three, or even four year aged tequilas. You see, if you mix different aged tequilas in a single bottle, you have to label it its youngest expression. So we get to play around with that notion and add older tequilas for, again, the complexity of flavor for, you know, different tones that you might get. Um, you know, this is going to have a beautiful kind of dark uh, prune, uh, caramel, a little bit of butterscotch um, flavoring. Um, again, very, very soothing, very easy. This is a great not only with cheese, but if you have dark chocolate, this goes really nice also. Um, salute. All right, you guys. So um, we're gonna do the other cheese. It's in the triangular shape. It's called Idiasa Ball. And this is from the Basque region of Spain. And um, so this one is sheep's milk. We've done, we've done the goat's milk with the Gouda, the cow's milk with the cheddar, and now we're on to sheep's milk. So we're now onto each of the major milk types. Uh, we selected this one because it's got, it's smoked. It is, um, this is the, the one and only Spanish Basque, it's from the Spanish side, uh, Basque region, that is protected by the Spanish system that, that protects their agricultural products. The same system or the same type of system that protects all the French products like Champagne. Spain has something similar. And this is a really traditional one that's been made for really for thousands of years in the Basque region of Spain and, uh, and they smoke it. Now this was originally uh, made by shepherds as they were um, you know, out on pasture with their sheep and, uh, and they would, they would uh, you know, camp out at night in their tents and they would, uh, they would of course 
not let any of the, the milk go to waste. And so they would make cheeses. They would hang these cheeses at the, in the rafters of their tents and they would let them, they, all the way, the, the, the liquid drain. And uh, as they cooked, as they cooked their food, and so the smoke would go up and hit the cheeses. And that's why these originally, or how these originally got smoked. Um, so to this day, um, they are smoked. And, um, and we selected it because a lot of tequilas do, especially the aged ones, have a smoky uh, flavor profile. And so we thought it would be complimentary. We thought it would be really different from the first few, but that was the thought process there. I'd be interested to get your, your thoughts on that. Uh, we don't carry a ton of smoked cheeses, but this one is really traditional. One thing that is tricky for us with the smoked cheeses is we don't want the smokiness to just totally overwhelm the cheeses. And we, f we feel like it's subtle enough on this one to where it's not, uh, it's not too overbearing. Um, really interesting too, what, when you were talking about the earth and the shortage of, of agave and um, in, in, in the growth in the last couple of years in your industry, we, we had the same, we have similar stuff that happens in, in our industry, in the cheese industry. We, you know, for, I should say first it was wine, then it was craft beer. And, uh, but in the last few years, craft cheese, and I say craft with a C, not with a K, um, has been uh, has been growing very very fast, and a lot of um, a lot of folks have gone back to the land. I mean, people who who went to school for other reasons have gone and and, and started farms and, and 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 have been making cheese in places all over the United States, and and so we have a lot of small batch production, and uh, it, they're kind of sprouting up everywhere, and it has been a, a real boom in our industry. And you've seen a lot of that with um, with all of like the craft. And when I when we say craft, it's a buzzword, you know. But it just means the handmade, um, you know, small amounts. There's there's even a lot of craft distilleries popping up around, and even here in uh, in San Diego. And uh, so I, I think what happened is people discovered flavor, and uh, <laughs> and and now we we can't turn back. Any other, any questions? Oh, we like this one. Nice. This was uh, good. Sounds like a couple of people liked this combination. And please try try this with, um, with the other cheeses as well, if you have any left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm trying, I'm, I'm mixing and matching as much as I can. Yeah, and so, um, you know, the other thing is we try to, with a lot of stuff going on, we, de we definitely try to take our time. So have a couple of bites of the fruit or the cracker to just kind of cleanse your palate because there's a lot going on. Uh, you, there's, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of flavor happening in your mouth. So you have to, we have to take our time to be able to experience all of it. Okay. So, any uh, any thoughts? Any uh, everyone just happy, having a good old time? I think there's a question there for you. Okay, do you let's see? Do you find the crystals in cow's milk cheeses? Um, let me like the cheddar we tasted. Do you find crystals? Um, we so the crystals in cheeses come from the aging process, and they're actually the 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 clinical name is tyrosine. And um, that, so it refers to the amino acids or the proteins in the milk. And they will usually show up at about a year. They'll, they'll maybe pop up at a year, but they'll get more and more pronounced over time. Uh, goudas, I would say goudas are the most crystally of any of the styles of cheese. Um, and then it's followed by cheddars and alpines. We don't, um, we don't have an alpine today, but that would be Gruyeres and you know Swiss style cheeses, um, but even some of the aged Italian cheeses have it too. Parmigiano Reggiano. I mean, if you can get a, a good like two year Parm, it'll it'll start to have the crystals. And uh, so the the crystals, if you do love that, come into the shop and say, give me the oldest cow's milk Gouda that you got, and it's going to be really really crystally. 
Um, and there's, there is salt in there as well, but really uh, it's more accurate to say that it, it is the, the proteins that crystallize. Good question. Um, so yeah, I, I, the other thing that um, you made me think about too, because I, you know, we talk about similarities, um, Serge, like when, I, when I hear you, you talk about the tequilas is, is terroir, which is the, um, the flavor of place or like the, the, the expression. And that was the word that you used for the agaves, like different expressions of, of agave. And um, cheesemakers, winemakers, what they're all really trying to do is just express the um their place they, they try they're trying to express their 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 geographic location through their food and through their agricultural products now for for cheese you are what you eat so uh it's about the diet of the animals and uh but even more than that anything that they introduce to the cheese any other ingredients they are at least if it's a traditional cheese they are a part of the environment so if they use tree bark, for example, to wrap the cheese, then that is um, from a local tree. If they use ash, like you'll see ashing on a lot of goat's milk cheeses, that is something local. Uh, if the cheese is washed, so they, um, there's a whole family of cheeses called washed rind cheeses, and that is where the cheesemaker will actually give the cheese a scrub and it makes it kind of like a stinkier, more pungent cheese. They're also known as stinky cheeses, but washed rind is the technical term. Um, they, they might wash it in a local cider or beer or wine um, because it, that is a further expression of place. Um, so for the, the Idiasa ball, they, they smoke it with, um, with applewood chips and, um, and, and they come from the region as well. Um, so it's it just know like if there's herbs added to it, if there is, um, Whatever, whatever lives in the cave that the cheese is aged, that's also considered part of terroir or the expression of that place. And, and that's, again, like, you know, Sergi mentioned the regulatory system for tequilas. Well, we have the same thing for, for cheeses. And uh, so they're all tied to their place. Brie is a place, cheddar is a place, Gouda is a place, um, and on and on and on. And uh, so Idiasabal is also the name of a, of a place. And uh, there's, a, there's a cheese from the French side of the Basque region called Oso Irati. And I'm sure we featured it on one of our tastings, but Oso Irati is the, there's only two cheeses that are protected, one by the Spanish and one by the, the French. But Oso Irati is from the Oso River Valley. Um, well, it's from between the Oso River Valley and Irati River Valley. It's like the same type of cheese, except it's not smoked. So if you if you like this, but maybe um, you want to try something a little different, look for the Oso Erati, really creamy sheep's milk. Just to touch on the on what you just said, uh, Rob. So on, on terroir. So biggest question or that we get is, are you highland or lowland tequila? Right. That's a mm -hmm. kind of the big thing. And uh, when that refers to is where you're getting your agave and where you make your tequila. So we're actually a little bit of both. Our agave farms are in a town called Atotonilco, which is in the highlands of Jalisco. And then um, we actually take those agaves and we take them to our distillery into the town of Tequila. The town is called Tequila. It's a legendary town with um, about two dozen distilleries. And that's where we make our tequila. So we get kind of the, uh, when, it, uh, when, you're, when the two types of, Agaves, uh, the highlands will usually give you kind of more citrusy, fruity flavor profile where the kind of um, lowland or what I call the heartland, which is the valley of tequila, which is still about 4,000 feet in altitude, will give you more kind of a uh, kind of vegetal flavors, a little uh, lightly metallic flavor profile. So we actually get our agave from the highlands, but we use the volcanic spring water from the heartlands. So in, an, in essence, we're a little bit of both. And uh, to touch on the, the smokiness, um, people ask us all the time, what's the difference between tequila and mezcal? So mezcal is uh, derived from two words. It's uh, in the a kind of ancient um, kind of Aztec language. It's a metal, which means um, uh, from, uh, it, it's cooked. And then ishkali, which means agave. 
So cooked agave is what mezcal is. Tequila and mezcal are the same by denomination, or sorry, by definition, but not by denomination. The, the easiest way to kind of uh, the, the talk about it is the three Ps, the plant, the process, and the place. So the plant, uh, tequila is made, uh, can only be made with blue web agave, and mezcal can be made of any of the other hundreds of uh, agave types, some of them wild, some of them um, farm. Then you have the process. The, uh, when cooking agave to make tequila, you usually use either some sort of oven, above ground oven, whether it be, you know, uh, brick, stone, or an autoclave, stain, uh, stainless steel autoclave is what we use. And then the place, you know, uh, there's uh, one of six regions in Jalisco where tequila can be made of. And then um, mezcal is one of eight regions in Jalisco that can that they, they can make um, mezcal. So that's the kind of the easiest way to kind of differentiate the uh, the two. Awesome. That's uh, I just I want to go to tequila and just take a selfie at the of the sign that says you're, you're all welcome <laughs> if any of you guys find yourself at the distillery give me a shout and we'll we'll give you a full tour we'd love to have you guys anybody, a, really, anybody can come there we should do tours one of these days when we can when we can travel again hopefully soon oh there's yeah a, there's there's a town called uh there's a town called cheddar literally and, and cheddar is um there's cheddar's the most popular cheese in the world but uh, no cheese is made in the town of Cheddar anymore. But it's all, it's made close by. And uh, so like in the cheese world, what we have is um, you have like the traditional cheeses that, that are, can legally take, take on the names, Brie or, um, you know, Camembert, Parmigiano Reggiano. And then we have mostly copycats, which is not always a bad thing. I mean, it, so they, they kind of take the recipe or they make a very similar cheese, but they become a brie style or a, a Gouda style. Or um, so, we, you know, we'll have a dozen at least brie's in the shop, but uh, maybe one will be from the region of brie. Or we, we might have one camembert from, that's from camembert, which is a town in Northern France. And the rest will be camembert styles. So. So many similarities. Um, okay, so are we ready for the next one? Let's do it. Sorry, I was obsessed with uh, Rihanna and Alex's dog. <laughs> they got there. Um, yeah, so last one, we've got our Fuerte. Our Fuerte is um, what we call strong. It's just 100 proof tequila. Don't be afraid. It's going to be okay. You'll survive <laughs> this. It's only 100 proof. Uh, I've actually gotten more often than not that our Fuerte is, is smoother or easier, dr easier drinking than our Blanco. Uh, the difference is obviously the proof. This is 100 proof, um, where our Blanco is only 80. And uh, another important difference is uh, this is, um, like I, I mentioned before, that our tequilas are distilled with two types of uh, uh, stills, the copper pot and the coffee column still. The Fuerte is just um, copper pot. So it's gonna give a little bit more of a bolder agave forward flavor profile, um, but still kind of that very light, delicate flavors as well. Um, you know, this is the purest form of a agave distillate that you can get. You see most, um, when you're making any kind of spirit, you often distill to a very, to a high proof and then you dilute it to what's, you know, kind of market standards of 80 per 80%. Uh, we distill to roughly, you know, 106. And then we kind of dilute it to the 80 or with this, which is the 100 proof. This is the closest thing from the still into the bottle that you get. Uh, this is a very, you know, very unique. We were one of the first ones to kind of start the uh, high proof tequila uh, into the market. So we're very proud of this product. This is a very uh, unique tasting tequila to me. It's very easy to drink and uh, you know, you're gonna get a lot of complexity, but still gonna be easy to drink in my opinion, of course. But you know, to that I say cheers. Again, thank you so much for joining us. This is awesome. I'm super pumped for this last cheese. I've been looking forward to this one, but uh, take it away, Rob. Yeah, so Fuerte, this is a Fuerte cheese. Strong. It's a, we save we save the strongest for last because um, this is this is the wildest and this is the glacier blue. Um, 
And it's funny, you said, Serge, like, not too strong for you. Well, I too have built up quite a tolerance for cheeses. Uh, and I, you know, I, I, I go straight for the, the strong, funky, stinky stuff. Yeah. The Glacier Blue is a natural rinded blue. This is from Washington State. It's from a small town called Trout Lake, which is in the shadow of uh, Mount Adams. And uh, so they, they've kind of revived cheese making in the area and they make this really traditional style um, blue cheese. It is, um, the rind looks really scary, but it's completely edible. It is natural. It's just dried up butterfat, whey, crust. Um, so it's meant to be eaten. This cheese is, when I say traditional, it's made in the most traditional way possible. It's organic. It is also um, raw milk and it's aged for about 75 days. Um, now, raw milk is, um, there's, it's illegal for us to, to import or sell any raw milk cheeses if they are under 60 days. So they wait, you know, just long enough um, for this one to where any of the harmful bacteria will have died off. But um, the really all of the traditional cheeses are made with, with raw milk, meaning it's, it's unpasteurized. And so there's um, all kinds of um, stuff going on during the aging process. The, 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 this is kind of based on um, a gorgonzola picante, which is a blue cheese from Northern Italy. There's, there's, there's a dolce, which is a really creamy kind of milder version. And then there's a, the picante, which means spicy, but it just means it's, it's got more blue in it and it's a little firmer. And sometimes with the, with the firm crumbly blues, you get kind of like a peppery spicy note to it. Um, but uh, I would definitely say if it's a little, I mean, if it's strong for you, hopefully the, the, um, the agave will balance it out a little bit. Try it with the hibiscus or with the kiwi or the apricot, that'll, that'll tame it a little bit um, if you do want to tame it. Uh, so there's lots of different things that you can do uh, with that. And um, so this, they're called Cascadia Creamery. And uh, they, they are an example of a couple who, who went back to, to making traditional cheeses and uh, they make, uh, so they make a, a good number of different styles of cheeses up there in Washington. They make, a, they make washed rind cheeses. They make um, Toma style cheeses, very, very much traditional European uh, style cheeses, but with, with an American twist on, on them. Um, American cheeses are, um, they're, they're basically inspired by the European classics. We don't have, we don't have the, AOC system or the DOP system that France or Italy that they have. So cheesemakers are free to, to really experiment and, and also to, to name the cheeses, whatever, whatever they want. Um, so Glacier Blue is, is because um, there's, um, of course, the, the terroir is so incredible up there because it's all glacier water that the cows are, are drinking. It's volcanic soil because they're in the shadow of that um, of that volcano. So it's just exquisite and perfect terroir. So hopefully, I hope you guys like the, the cheese. I got, I, got couple, I got a couple apple slices that, that I cut for this occasion. Um, it's pairing very nicely with the apple and the reposado is tasting really nicely with the blue cheese. So definitely give, give that a shot. Well, uh, well, this is fun, I, and uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully everybody had a good time, learned something. If we're, we'll stay on for a few minutes, but uh, please, if you guys have any questions or any follow-ups, you can, uh, you you know where to find us. Um, Rob at Venissimo com. Serge, you want to? Yeah. Um, so a uh, couple, um, the most common retailers for um, Don Fulano. Well, uh, uh, Old Town Liquor, Old Town Tequila has all of our expressions. If you visit uh, donfulano.com, you'll be able to get more information also. Um, uh, you know, my, my email is sergio at donfulano.com. Feel free to email me any questions you might have. Or if you want to, if you're planning a trip to Mexico, you know, I can definitely give you guys some good spots to go check out for sure. Especially yeah. in Guadalajara and, and Mexico City. Um but yeah, you know, I'd love to hear 
everybody's favorite pairing so far. Um, either, yeah, either you type it or, or you know, or uh, just uh, say it out loud. But this was awesome. I appreciate everybody uh, hanging out with us today. Yeah, huge thank you to, to Serge for, for bringing it um, and, and dropping off all the kits at all the different shops. It was, uh, it was really fun. It's just so fun for us to experiment and to try different things. There's, there's no, I mean, there's nothing off limits. I mean, you can, you can try, break all the rules. That's my only, my rule is break all the rules uh, and, and, and just try, um, you know, try everything. Um, whatever the, whatever the, uh, whatever the books say, go against it. Try the wild card pairings. Yeah. Um, you know, tequila and cheese, man. Tequila and cheese. You can't go wrong. You cannot go wrong. And midnight moon. Okay. Ooh, marzipan on top. Ooh. Yeah. I like that. Try the marzipan on the, um, on the blue cheese too. Okay. I'm going to do that right now. I mean, you can't go wrong with any of it. And we're going to, um, there was a couple comments about, um, the, the trips we do now we have, um, we call our, our trips Venny Voyages, and we started doing them a few years ago, and uh, we had to put 2020 on hold, but um, we, are still, we are still looking to do tw fall 2021. We haven't canceled our Alps trip, and we're going to start and end in Munich and, uh, and then go and see cheesemakers in Austria and Switzerland, but uh, we're going to keep expanding that, um, that branch of Venissimo. And, uh, and there's no reason why we can't go to Scotland for whiskey and why we can't go to Mexico for tequila. So, um, so stay tuned for all that stuff. Cause I mean, we're kind of, we're kind of joking, like let's go, but I'm not, I'm kind of serious too. <laughs> so we can talk about that Serge. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe now is not the time, but maybe in a couple of months we can really talk about that. Done. Done. You bring so, the cheese, I'll have the tequila ready. <laughs> I'll have it ready. Ooh, Blanco Midnight Moon with the jam. Very nice. Okay. Very nice. I found the Blanco to really to pair nicely with a lot of these cheeses. Like, yeah. It's just kind of that, that it's so like light and easy. And although the Blanco has really blended really nicely with the um with most of the cheeses. And yeah, the blue cheese, the only one I would say is like the reposado has was my favorite, particularly. Yes, and then somebody else had the cheddar with the Blanco. Blanco seems to be uh, a favorite. All of them were smooth, which uh, I agree with that. Appreciate that, yeah. Do it. Well, Love it. That's awesome. Good stuff. Well, thank you again, Serge, and thank you, everybody, for, uh, for joining us. Stay tuned. There's much more, uh, much more ahead. I, I don't have the schedule in front of me, but I know we're going to be doing – um, some more wino Wednesdays. We do the, the, we pick a varietal or, you know, a, a, a style and we do wines every other week. We're also doing some good uh, cooking classes coming up. I think uh, maybe this Sunday or the next Sunday, we're doing a pizza making class. So check out the, the schedule and uh, we'll see you all again soon. And Serge, you're the man. Um, cheers. cheers Salute. Cheers, Salute everybody. Guys. Yeah. Happy Sunday. Cheers. Absolutely, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. And love, loved every part of this, guys. Honestly, this is awesome. So much fun. Thank you so much, Rob. Have a great night, everybody. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.